Hello, this is Greg Allison from Galactic Gregs and Green Gregs coming to you on 23 November 21. Time on deck is 18, 1300 hours Central Daylight Time. Now, what I'm talking about tonight is space wars, the threat of space wars, which just increased quite immeasurably with uh, Russia's President Putin threatening to take out the United States GPS satellite system. You know, that thing that you use with your phone that tells you how to get from place to place, which most of you don't know how to get anywhere without it anymore today. Well, that is a threat now, at least according to Putin and uh, his recent anti-satellite weapons test, which also threatens manned space activity, like the International Manned Space Station, which is half Russian, and even the, the Chinese uh, space station that's taken us on board. So guys, we are in a peculiar situation right now, and there's drivers behind this. I'm going to go all into this. I'm going to talk about uh, th this system, its capabilities, questions about it, and we're going to talk about motives and we'll weigh potentials for this to happen. And we'll talk about things that you need to do that you need to get ready. So subscribe to my channels, bang the notification bell, and click all to get more videos about what's happening. For Galactic Gregs, more space videos. For Green Gregs, more prepping and gardening videos. So I've got two channels and I'm representing both of them with this video today because this is an intersection topic between things that you need to know about to prep for and space, and particularly space war, which I've not covered on Galactic Gregs before. Um, so let's, let's buckle up. We're going to get all into it. And uh, for those of you that don't know, I've got some special deals. Uh, Right now, if you really want to prepare, one, one thing you ought to do is consider growing your own garden. Because if we have this conflict, guys, it ain't just be the satellite systems we're going to lose. We're going to lose our power grid and ability to grow, uh, buy food because there won't be any power. The stores won't be open. The, the whole nation will basically collapse. But you can grow your own greens in your home, even with microgreens. Go to True Leaf Market. Uh, right now, if, uh, check the links underneath the channel to True Leaf Market. And right now you can get for the Black Friday, 15% off if you use the code while it lasts 15, 15% off while it lasts 15, but use the link below to get into Tree Leaf Market. All right, enough said on that. And we're gonna get into this. Um, many of you know that our International Space Station astronauts climbed into their crew quarters because of fear of debris from an ASAT anti-satellite weapons test conducted by Russia on the 15th of November, just eight days ago, a date to remember. Now I may post this later today or even tomorrow. So just hang on to your hats because I got another interview coming up real fast. But um, they took out their Teslana D satellite, also known as Cosmos 1408, um, which is with their own satellite. They launched that satellite 40 years ago. So it's a derelict satellite. The problem with this is that when they hit that satellite, it created 1,500 approximately trackable items of debris. These are bullets zinging around in space at 17,500 miles an hour or thereabouts, maybe a little faster, because that is the minimum uh, velocity or escape velocity to orbit Earth, 17,500 miles per hour. Now, some of it will be going faster, some will be going slower. So when you hit something like that in space, you know, with the energies is the energy because one has mass times velocity squared. And with those kind of velocities, that is packing enormous energy. I mean, it's like a, a little bit packs more energy than a stick of dynamite at, at those kind of speeds. So uh, what happens is now we've created a whole lot of zingers and bullets zinging around in lower orbit. So it's not just that one occasion at the International Space Station, perhaps the Chinese Space Station, and other space stations won't be at risk. That stuff's going to be at risk over and over and over again as these debris cloud flows around. To think about that, now that's the trackable debris items, 1,500. They're made roughly. There's going to be specks of paint and other things. It can cause very significant damage that's not trackable. Hopefully it's in the same debris cloud. This debris cloud spreads out over time and becomes more dispersed, harder to... Uh, Dodge, like they did on that. They had a divert maneuver. The, the, the guys climbed in their capsules, their escape pods, the, the Soyuz, and I guess the SpaceX Dragon capsule in case they had to make an escape. They shut the hatches. They found their spacesuits in case the capsule got breached and lost atmosphere, in case the space station got breached. If the space station had a hole knocked in it big enough, 
uh, it would outgas very rapidly and that would actually provide thrust. The space station is not built to have thrust uh, along axes that, you know, <laughs> that it's not expecting it. The space station is a very ungainly type vehicle. It's fine for space uh, in, in a near vacuum and orbiting, but if you suddenly put a thrust vector along the module walls somewhere, it could rip the entire space station apart as it starts to spin out of control. The whole thing could shred to pieces. If you're on board, you got to get off. If you say, oh, everybody loves the cupola windows. They're great to look at. If something hit one of those windows and broke it, everything else is going to be flying toward those windows and it's probably smash out the rest of them. And you would have an enormous thrust there. The space station would depressurize in no time flat. Astronauts on board will lose consciousness. And so that's another thing. You, you get loss of consciousness and ability to operate because, you know, you lose consciousness in you know, just a couple of minutes uh, under a depressed situation like that. So it's very dangerous for astronauts. And those astronauts, that's why they climbed in their crew capsules. They were ready to bug out and had on their spacesuits. They were ready to bug out. They were in danger. But it wasn't just American astronauts in danger. There were Russian astronauts on board. Putin took a chance with his own the space station's part Russian. Russia owns part of the International Space Station. It's not just an American complex. He took risk with his own assets and over his own people. Why did he do that? They wrote it off. Russia wrote it off like, yeah, it's nothing. Well, it wasn't nothing. And, you know, they're at risk continuously now. So, but they deemed this risk worthwhile. Why? We're going to get into that. We're going to talk about that some more. But what we're, we're going to back up and talk a little bit about this weapon system, what they now call Star Warrior, you know, like Star Wars. Star Warrior is the name of that missile. And we're going to talk about uh, their threat. Basically, Putin said that he's going to take out 32 satellites, American satellites, and he claimed it was going to be the United States GPS satellites if we cross the red lines that they've established. There are certain red lines in the world that if we cross them, uh, or Europe crosses them, they said they're going to take out these satellites. Hmm. There's a lot of interesting parameters here we got to discuss. Um, so we'll, we'll start with the Star Warrior itself. And uh, <clears throat> the Star Warrior missile is thought to be a two stage missile, uh, the uh, 14TS033. 14TS033. Also, it's evolving in, in two or being replaced by the a-235, I believe it's A-135 before. Uh, this is a two-stage missile. This is the intercept missiles they've had around Moscow, at least the 135s. Around Moscow is, uh, is their uh, anti-ballistic missile system missiles. Uh, we have missiles in Fort Greeley and at Vandenberg Air Force Base to intercept missiles. Mo Moscow's had these all along. You know, they, you know, they throw rocks at us for having this. Well, they had them all along. In fact, uh, they've had more of these than we got. So, uh, you know, it's kind of Interesting that they should pick at us for putting those system up there at Fort Greeley and at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Fort Greeley was my last duty station, Fort Greeley, Alaska, north of the Alaska Range. <laughs> I was in the Coal Regions Test Center there. So uh, <clears throat> these uh, uh, these missiles uh, in their final version, so they can get to carry conventional warheads or they believe in its final version, a nuclear warhead. So that may make sense because this missile theoretically could only reach 500 miles. The uh, geosynchronous satellites are 12,550 miles approximately, way out of reach of this missile. So how is it that Putin is claiming he's going to take out our GPS satellites instantaneously? Well, okay, is he going to launch 32 missiles? 32 missiles that can't quite reach the target? Hmm. How's he making such a grandiose claim? How and why is the Military taking it seriously, seriously. <laughs> oh, by the way, I've been to Moscow, great city, loved it. I've been and visited Rock Cosmos there, which is the uh, Russian space agency. And I've also been to their company, Inky, that launched the probe that landed on Venus. I got, a, you know, I got an affinity for Venus, which y'all don't know. And, you know, including plans for how to actually colonize Venus. You can see my other videos on that on Galactic Gregs. But I got a lot, of, a lot of admiration for those people and those engineers and the technical accomplishment of actually landing a satellite on the surface of a planet that's twice as hot as a soldering iron. It can melt lead instantly with pressures like 90 times our atmosphere, which will crush just about anything here, and actually take photographs and transmit them back to the Earth. <laughs> Amazing accomplishment. And a good, a good 
good people. I enjoyed my trip there. Good people. You know, but it's a shame that we have these misunderstandings between us and them. It's a darn shame. And I think we've in part driven Russia into China's arms. That's another shame. We should, should, we should have cut deals with Russia a long time ago and maybe had them on our side because China, for the long term, would be the greater adversary of both of us. And we both would have a lot to gain from that. I'll go on that more in the future because that's, that's worthy of a whole lot of discussion right there as to how we wound up being so adversarial to, with them right now. Of course, y'all were rather we're poised to invade, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, if we had kept the right kind of deals, this might not be happening. Also, if we had a stronger administration in Washington, D.C., when you appear weak, everybody picks them. When you're a weak kid on the block, you get kicked. And right now, we're acting weak. So we're getting kicked. We have not so much respect right now in the world. We need respect. We've lost it. Uh, so that's the price we pay for the loss of respect. So we need to get our respect back. And you get respect by being strong, not by being weak. When you're the strong kid on the block, everybody wants to curry favor to you. When you're the weak kid, they want to kick you. So let's don't be kicked. Being strong don't mean you got to use it. You know, the gentle laughing giants, while they gentle and while they laugh, because they can afford to be. That's where the United States needs to be, but not unwisely using its force either. I can talk a lot more about that. That's not two or three topics on all this stuff. That's just an aside. There's good people anywhere on earth, in every town, in every village, every hamlet, through the farms and countryside. There's good people anywhere you go on earth. Inside, we're all the same. But you know, there's always bad people. They tend to percolate to the top in governments around the world. And there's good and bad anywhere you go. Unfortunately, it's the governments that pit us against each other because that's how they gain their power. But sometimes they can go right and go very wrong. And we're taking a lot of chances in the world right now. And it's very unfortunate because I don't think a lot of people realize the risk of what we're taking. Russia, it would be a formal enemy. We do not want a war with Russia. They have these things called SAR bombers, 100 megaton nuclear devices that can be mounted on their Poseidon torpedoes. That one of them could take out the entire coast of the United States with a radioactive tsunami. And yeah, and they're also, that, that they could also put two megaton warheads on them and take out, oh, the size, it is size. The, the, the Poseidon torpedo is a nuclear powered UAV submarine, basically. Well, not UAV, but <laughs> submerged unmanned submerged vehicle that could, it's got thousands of miles of range, almost infinite because it's nuclear powered. It could some bomb the sea and come up at some point later. These are very, very dangerous weapons. You can't you combine that with our hypersonic missiles, their ICBM force, the, the new, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the new missiles are developed, the Sarmont uh, missile, uh, which they could actually fly over Antarctica and hit us in the south instead of flying them over the North Pole. Where you, guys, they've got some very formidable weapons in Russia. We do not want a war with Russia. I'm going to tell you something. I felt at home in Moscow, by the way. Why, why are we, and I walk around and why, why do we want to kill these people? Why do they want to kill us? That's what I would think. That's what I was thinking more right now. We, we just fundamentally, person to person, we don't have that much difference. It's a shame that we're pitted in this way today. That the leaders of the countries get us all wrapped up against each other. It's a darn shame. Technically, engineers, yeah, hey, I'm an engineer. I enjoyed meeting the engineers there in Moscow. I, I really admired them, what they did. So <clears throat> and I also admired the challenges they face. But, you know, that's engineer to engineer. If we had more person to person contact in these countries, maybe we wouldn't have all the strife we have. But, you know, our leaders are taking us down some bad roads. Uh, but all that said, that aside, let's look at what, what is out there, what the threat is to us. I'm going to share some sites here. With you. First, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of relay more about this te weapons test. Uh, there's a, P a Putin propagandist, uh, uh, Kaslov, who uh, told his viewers, he said, Russia does not need conflict. Now, well, that I agree. <clears throat> he said, Russia needs guarantees of security uh, in order to rule out the possibility of provocations uh, capable of spilling over into full-scale military confrontations, and we will continue to clearly and consistently delineate our red lines, which no one is permitted to cross. Now, see, the problem is, yeah, they're, they're about to, to launch an invasion, maybe. And how we're going to, we may be at war, world war with Russia imminently in Europe. 
So even though I just said all these glowing things about them, that don't mean that we may not be drug into a major war. Whether we start it or not, we can get drug into it. Why? Because both France and Britain are basically pledging to back Ukraine up whether we do or not, and we're NATO allies with France and Britain. If Russia retaliates against them, then we are treaty bound to engage against Russia. You see how things could spiral? We could wind up in a war against Russia just over the spiral of things related to the Ukraine. And Ukraine is not a NATO country. We'll talk a bit more about Ukraine at the end because we're going to talk about motives. But let's, uh, let's kind of get back on this. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to this weapons test, re, you know, Western officials such as uh, NASA's uh, administrator, uh, Bill Nelson, who I met, I've been in his office. Uh, he said, I'm outraged. Well, I've been in his office before he was NASA administrator because back then he was Senator Bill Nelson. Before that, he was Congressman Bill Nelson and he flew aboard a spatial as a congressman prior to the Challenger accident, uh, incidentally. So he's actually been to space. He said, I'm outraged by this irresponsible and destabilizing action with a long and storied history of, in human space flight. It's unthinkable that Russia would endanger not only the American and international partner astronauts on the ISS, but also their own astronauts. Their actions and rec their actions are reckless and dangerous, threatening as well the Chinese space station and taconauts on board. So, and yes, uh, uh, the, the uh, United Kingdom Defense Secretary Wallace added the destructive anti-satellite missile test by Russia shows a complete disregard for the security and safety and sustainability of space. Well, it's pretty close to that. It really is all that debris. Oh, what I didn't say about that debris. The problem with having this big debris field, what's gonna happen with this debris field is it will always travel around the center of mass of the original objects hit. Of course, now you got some impact momentum from one hit and the other, but this explosion is gonna follow a center of mass, but that doesn't mean that the particles won't spread out. Each of these particles are capable of hitting another satellite, which could turn into 1,500 shards of debris. And if, it, if these 1,500 manage to hit two other satellites, there could be another, you know, uh, 3,000 shards. Then you get, you know, 6,000 shards. They each hit two or four satellites, you know, and then, and then, you know, then it might be uh, 12,000 shards. You see, this could go exponential. This could become a runaway cascading event. Like a chain reaction, like what happens in a, you know when you have a nuclear reaction where you get atoms splitting, particles going out splitting other atoms, and they bust and split other atoms, and it just grows real fast. Chain reaction. This can make orbit inaccessible. There could be so much debris up there you couldn't fly anything, couldn't even launch through it hardly. This could be a, a catastrophe that denies all access to space. Now, if you're a country whose main adversary thrives and can beat you because they have better access to space, eh, maybe it's a win for you. Maybe it's a win for you. So it just happens this. This is what you need to know about the United States. The United States is reliant on that GPS system, just like you are, like you're relying on your phone to get from point A to B, you don't know how to find grandma's house anymore without your GPS, probably. <laughs> how many of you use your GPS all the time? How many of you still use old maps or try to navigate by sight? Some of us do, some of us oldies. I got a lot of young people tell me they can't do that. What happens if you lose it? Our missiles need this. Our aircraft need it. Our ships need it. GPS was developed as a military system, not as something to help you find grandma's house. GPS was developed to guide missiles, precision missiles, right down a smokestack. <laughs> Remember the, the first Gulf War? How we, we, we did all this, we're putting this in through that window, we're gonna put this in down that smokestack. Uh, yeah, that's because of our GPS system, the amazing accuracy that it provides us. All of our weapon systems are GPS dependent. All of our ships, our planes. If you take out GPS, we're in deep trouble. You take out our command and control, I'm gonna go more on that. Our military command and control, we're in double trouble. How is it that Putin says he could take out these satellites? How is it that he says he could do this when they're at 12,550 miles roughly and this weapon system is only gonna go to 500 miles and it's launching from Russia. Well, I did say that it was gonna be nuclear capable, didn't I? And he did say he could take them all out instantaneously. There's only one way to do that with this missile system. Maybe he's got some other missile system in his hip pocket and got 32 of them sitting there. He's going to fire them off. 
Maybe. Maybe he's going to launch nuclear warheads. No, he's not going to nuke 32 satellites directly. We're talking electromagnetic pulse. Now on Earth, electromagnetic pulse is bad, so bad because uh, the gamma rays from the uh, nuclear device strip off electrons in our atmosphere and create an electrical wave of pure electricity shooting through the atmosphere. This is the E1 and E2 waves that we get. E1 being a short wave, uh, high intensity uh, uh, energy form, and E2 is just like light, more or less. E3 is a longer wave waveform that you will also get out. And that can travel through the ground, by the way. And it can be very powerful. Russia's done some weapons tests like their hat scale star bomber, and they found electrical systems underground getting ripped to shreds miles away from the event. So uh, yeah, this one on the ground will flow as ground current. There's such thing as terrestrial current, ground current. And that's where our transformers are threat. So I and other people are you selling you stuff in your home and they I want to conduct everything in the ground. Eh, not nah, gonna work. <laughs> oh, we can predict 42 EMP events. Ha 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 ha. You gotta be kidding me. There's no way. I am an electrical engineer, by the way. So, and I've worked in military systems. And I'm gonna tell you anything with a wire on the size of a speaker wire is not gonna protect you from all this stuff. Okay, guys, just put that in the bank. Okay, so let's go back to this. The uh, flow of the um, uh, of this electricity really is magnified by our atmosphere, but in space, you can still get hit. It can still take out satellite systems. Uh, they may, but because of the geometry of space, because you know, you know, half the satellites on one side of the earth and half are on the other, you know, 12,500 miles, or, you know, you know, even if you're over here, you're going to see a bunch of them on the other side because there's only 8,000 miles in diameter, okay? So that's like a quarter more in diameter or better. So, uh, yeah, so if you set off one, it could see the satellites on the other places, but really, I would say if he's going to take them all out instantaneously, he's got more than one launch site. So maybe they're going to launch someone from Asia, maybe the Pacific or somewhere else, maybe three or four launch sites, or just do it uh, repeatedly a few times as the satellite spin around and take out a bunch of them that way. But you think they're going to do it right over Mother Russia and even here their own country? No, I think not. These are mobile missiles that we're talking about here. I think they're going to put them on ships, put them in the Atlantic, the Pacific, somewhere else, so that it doesn't take out Mother Russia. Uh, so, you know, that's and probably more the Atlantic, maybe on our side closer. They can watch these in different places. That's what I would expect. Maybe South Pacific, you know, way off from Russia. So uh, South Atlantic, they can take out a lot of satellites that way. So we're talking EMP events, some right over the United States perhaps, because if you EMP the United States, our, our nation's done. I've talked about this in Green Greg's videos many times, how the EMP committee, uh, how the Congressional EMP Committee uh, back 12, 13 years ago had determined that uh, nine out of 10 people would not survive a year due to societal co collapse. And, I, and I've also mentioned why that was very optimistic, actually. Because we've got to deal with our nuclear power plants and we've got to deal with the spent fuel rods. And I got an interview with the guy uh, at the top of, uh, at actually 1900 hours, Central Daylight Time today, where I'm going to talk to him. And it's going to be a live session on Green Greg's. And that will probably air before this one, unfortunately, because it just takes time to put these together and get them out and get them aired. So <clears throat> check Green Greg's for that video. So I'll be talking with Steve Curtis, Stephen Curtis about that. Or maybe I've already talked to him about it by the time you see this. <laughs> probably. So that'll be a live session. Now, bear in mind that uh, this EMP threat is huge. And there's other communications access methods that Russia is looking at to take out our comm systems. They, they have an extensive jamming network. They claim that they can take it everything within 6,000 miles. Of course, you got it over the horizon. So, you know, that's way over, you know, that's way high when you go over the horizon, unless they got this distributed over a wide network. But at the horizon level, yeah, airplanes, I could see the airplanes and so maybe. That also takes a lot of power, a lot of RF output power to reach out at that distance. So I'm kind of skeptical about that distance and maybe even about taking out all our GPS satellites instantaneously. And they cited 32. Actually, we have 31 in orbit according to the data I see. So I don't know where the 32 number comes from unless there's something else that's also targeted. But bear in mind 
a lot of our communications and a lot of what our military depends on isn't just the GPS satellites. We have a ton of communications. Our whole military uses command and control systems, data fusion, where you get data from one system. It's integrated with a with a F-35. That's integrated with a piece of artillery on the ground and, and a naval ship and across all of our forces. This is what the United States is developing. That's a very communications intensive system that requires uh, electronics. It's all susceptible to EMP can be easily taken out or jammed. That's how we fight our wars. We get somebody with jamming capability, somebody can take out our satellites, somebody can take out our EMP or country. Great, we'll just launch our nuclear missiles. Uh, we'll, we'll come up with our submarines and we'll turn them into glass. No, not really. An EMP, a super weapon that could put out 200,000 volts per meter, which is the United, which the Soviets have uh, admitted as it was published in the congressional record in 2008 upon testimony of a former NASA administrator, acting administrator, and Soviet weapons expert, William Graham, who's also one of the leading experts on EMP in the United States. He testified that the Soviet generals told him they had EMP super weapons capable of putting out 200,000 volts per meter. And at that time, our hardened standard for our military installations was, I mean, for our hardened military system, most of our military installations are not hardened, but for special weapon systems, 50,000 volts per meter, four times more powerful. So if we can't get out the uh, emergency action messages, we don't launch anything. Nobody launches either our missile fields in the Dakotas or the submarines without a validated emergency action message. There'd be no launches. And with sufficient EMP strikes, that system might not exist or be capable of reaching the people that would react, those submarines. Oh yeah, they'd be tracking our submarines. I got those Sarbamas that would probably aim for some of those and some of our uh, aircraft carrier fleets. So the Soviet military is a very formal military. Like I said, we do not want a war with Russia. Trust me, we do not want a war with Russia. We need to find some way to get along with them or at least tolerating them. And I, hey, I found, I took Moscow very tolerable. I enjoyed it quite a bit, by the way. So and I'm not a, you know, hey, I'm not claiming to be pro this or pro that. I'm just saying we don't want the war, okay, guys? We don't want this war. But we got to watch this red line business because I think we're actually walking across the looks of things. But so may, they, so may be the Russians. Okay, let's go into all this. I'm going long here. <laughs> this takes a little time to develop. My apologies for that. But there's a lot involved here. So I'm going to do some share screens here, guys. Just bear it with me. Uh, one momentum, please. And ding, ding, ding. let's see here. Give me a second. One, as Lily Tomlin used to say, one momentum, please. Share screen. Bing, 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 bing. And let's see, here we go. Russia defends anti-satellite missile test it called uh, that U.S. called reckless and dangerous. So, yeah, this is that article here. And this is NASA's, yeah, nothing, I've told you all this already. Mission control. That's more space station control. So, uh, yeah, this is the sun. They got a neat graphic on this showing how this intercept will take place. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the graphic because it's their own little proprietary picture. We will continue to clearly and consistently delineate our red lines, which no one is permitted to cross. Dmitry Kiselov, I hope I said that right. Might have murdered his name. You know, they're talking about A23 missile system, which I mentioned earlier. Oh yeah, they tested this thing for several years. This is the radar system. This is the launcher, mobile launcher. They could put this on a ship. It could put that on a cargo ship, for that matter, supply ship, any kind of ship that's big enough. So th this is pretty serious. Space wars. Oh, yeah, this is pretty much what I said earlier there. So, yeah, they, they see it. They identify their threat. They, 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 the missile launches and intercepts. But, you know, we know where all the GPS satellites are going to be, so they wouldn't have a hard time doing that. And we'll have 
just right, just hit this. Um, what I really hate about Zoom is it fights me when I try to change tabs. So it always comes down right where I want to go. Russians weapons test endangers the International Space Station, as we know that. Well, that President Biden makes Jimmy Carter seems church Hillian in comparison is added incentive for Russia to misbehave. Well, I mentioned that earlier. This isn't the hill. What's the hill? This is a newspaper you find in all the cafeterias all over Capitol Hill. So they're really spanking the <laughs> administration hard. I mean, it's supposed to be a bipartisan paper, at least I thought it was. But wow. The diminishment of Russia as a superpower is no more vividly revealed in its space activities. In times past, Russia's space program was so robust that it was considered a threat to the free world. Soviet space first, such as Sputnik and the free flight of the uh, first human beings in space. Your Gagarian spirit inspired President John F. Kennedy to launch the moon race, which we won in July the 20th of 1969. So, okay. I don't want to go too much into that kind of stuff. Let's come back over here. This is a, quite an article on this, same kind of stuff. Well, let's look at the GPS on us, guys. Like I said, space signal, what the target is. These guys are 1,200, 550 miles up. There's claims there's 31 of them in here. So, yeah, and that's an expanded network, but they're way out there in orbit. So it would take a nuclear device to reach them. So uh, we had to have 24 to be operational, quite frankly. I don't look at all that. Here's something else to pay attention to. So I've talked about EMP on our country, how they could take our comm system here domestically, our power grid domestically, that could bring our nations to our nation to non-existence almost. And then I've talked about the Sarbamas, uh, how they could also be used against our aircraft carriers and our submarines of fill, how our submarines of fill cannot react if they don't get their EAMs, how all our military communications can be taken down and jamming. This is some of the Russian mobile jamming systems here. These are very robust trucks. They got to have some really good power supplies to be able to reach out with enough uh, power to really do the jamming. But guys, they have a fleet of these, uh, Kavant SPN2s, 1RL248-2 uh, high power Q-band radar jammers. These are radar jammers. This, this is just a part of their, and this is like our old Deucen has. I used to drive an army pretty much. Not quite as long as our decent hats were, but uh, these are these, these trucks are heavy loaded out in the snow, all wheel drive uh, with huge jamming systems, huge jamming systems. You see that? And they got lots of them, lots of them. And they got plenty of other jamming equipment. Russia, so that's a whole different uh, con uh, antenna configuration there than what was on the other vehicles. Russia is totally prepared to try to jam everything in their theater of warfare. Can they pull it off? Will it work in practice? You tell me. I hope we never find out. That's my answer. I hope we never, ever find out. But the Russians are no joke in this matter, guys. And considering our reliance on these communication systems, the, the Western reliance, uh, the reliance of our alliance on communications, yeah, we, that's our Achilles heel. We got a bunch of Achilles heel and they got an air pointed in every one of them. What is that? <laughs> oh yeah, visualization of, the, uh, uh, visualization of this debris field. Uh, let's play this one. It shows how ISS has barely missed it. This is the stuff coming up over the horizon after it's a debris fill. That's low information. Let me find something better here. I know there's another video I'd rather show. Yeah, it's what it wants to be set over the horizon. I think this is the one I want to see. No. Maybe, okay. Uh, 
it shows a, well, this isn't the video ahead in mind, but it shows a big cloud of debris spread. Now, can you see that? I was just. You see, this, the, that's the problem. This debris cloud is spreading, which means it's like a shotgun blast. It can hit a lot of stuff. And over the years, it's going to be up there. It can do a lot of damage. This may be the visualization I really wanted to show you. No, we just did that one. Okay, there's another visualization somewhere. I really want to show you guys, but I, I must be in a different video. Okay, let's talk about motivation. Why would Russia want to do these kind of things? Why is Russia pushing so hard? The blue countries are NATO. This is Russia. Now, that don't mean that all these are Russia. No, these are just non-aligned nations here. Switzerland, uh, Czechoslovakia, let's see, uh, we got uh, Hungary actually, not Hungary, Austria, Switzerland and Austria are not aligned here. And we got um, Ireland, we got a lot of the former Yugoslavian states are not allied. So Turkey is NATO, although Turkey and Greece are maybe on the verge of going to war with each other. So over Crete, they've been, they've been struggling over Crete for years. And Recep Tur Erdogan has got very aggressive uh, designs on recreating the Ottoman Empire. But we have, at one time, the Russians wanted all of this. This was all in the Warsaw Pact. All this used to be in Russia's alliance. All these nations here were dominated by Russia. All of them right here. Russia won a lot of cushion between them and the West. Now, Russia at one time had street signs for every street in Europe, and they fully had plans to take over Europe. They didn't do it because of the nuclear deterrence of the West. So they had aggressive plans, but they fear also aggression from the West. I know this for a fact. And it may be, in my mind, it's today irrational because I can't see the France and Germany of today invading Russia. Yeah, the strength Russia has, and the weaknesses I see in those countries, I could in no way see that happening. But Russia can. So I'm going to stop the share here. Russia can see that happen. Russia worries about that. Russia dwells on that. Why? Because Russia did get invaded by France once upon a time by Napoleon. And they used slash and burn basically to starve his forces out. And then Hitler's forces invaded, invaded Russia. And that was very costly to the Russian people. Many Russians died. They had a long, hard fight against the Nazis. Fort Greeley was actually built as an airfield to supply Russia during World War II, by the way. <laughs> That's got missile systems. Actually, not adequate to defend us against Russia, but more North Korea, maybe, possibly against North Korea. I'm not sure they're even adequate for that, as North Korea is expanding their capabilities very fast. But that said, uh, Russia, I went to an opera when I was in Moscow. I went to an opera inside the Kremlin. The Kremlin's the big red wall, you know, big wall, got red square inside. Well, I was in, I believe it's the Diet. It was where the Russian equivalent of our Congress meets and uh, Politburo and all those guys, that's where they meet. And so, I, you know, we went inside. They had this big opera, oh, long line to get in there. And it had the dancing Cossacks in it and all that. Well, the whole thing was a celebration of Russia's victory over the Germans. They still think about that a lot because they lost a lot of people. It was a really hard fight. And they celebrate that to this day. And they worry about that. That's very much in the minds of the Russian people today. Just like the South hasn't quite got over the North and made them yet, you know, from 150 years ago. So it's, it's like that. It's like that in Russia, you know, except World War II is a little bit more recent in their memories than our war between the states here in the United States. So uh, the Russians are very much caught up in that. That's why they want it padded. And as we take that padding away, they're feeling exposed, they're feeling vulnerable. Plus they also feel the humiliation of loss of empire of their once greatness that they had. Now, when it comes to Ukraine, you know, that's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. It's not because the West realized the danger uh, that it could bring to war with Russia. They realized fully 
that bringing NATO, uh, Ukraine into U, uh, NATO was a huge risk because Russia's really was wanting to pound them and has been for a while. You gotta bear in mind that Eastern Ukraine is very heavily populated by people of Russian descent, Russian language, Slavic, the, the Slavic Russians are very heavy. And the further east you go, the heavier that is. Now I've seen two sets of figures that, that makes it, one is, makes it look predominantly Russian and the other don't. So I assume each were put forward by the re, opposite camps, you know, claiming, you know, what the population is in those areas. I don't know, but what I will tell you is this. I do believe that a people should have the right to self-determination. If a district or a state votes that they want to separate from their country, and be independent or join another country, they should have that right anywhere in the world to secede, to have their own self-determination. That's real democracy at its best. It's allowing people to decide what their future is. Why can't you do that? What's wrong with that? It shouldn't be a war between one side and the other to do it. There shouldn't be an invasion. But I've mentioned something before on the Green Bridge Channel, and that is Russia's main warm, war, main warm water port on Earth is in Crimea. I've gone into more detail on that in previous videos. I'm not going to go into that greatly in this video. But I said Russia would fight a nuclear war over Crimea. Because that is to them such an important strategic asset. There's no way on earth they're going to give that up. And it's almost entirely Russian populated. And the place overwhelmingly voted to join Russia. So I really would be inclined to say, okay, let the Russians have Crimea. And those eastern uh, most provinces of Ukraine, if they really vote to go, why not? Most of Ukraine don't want nothing to do with it, but Ukraine is also the breadbasket of, Eurasia, of Europe and big parts of Asia. So there's a lot of temptation there for Russia to take it. Not to mention, that, Ukraine, that, that Crimea is somewhat isolated on the land and are having problems with getting water. So I can see Russia pushing about halfway into the Ukraine. They probably wouldn't go into Kyiv. Well, they might take it over just to win the war. Would they occupy it? Would they take all of Ukraine? I don't know. I hope that don't happen. I hope none of this happens. But they got 100,000 troops on the border right now. They re they re-brought their troops in and they're rattling their sabers. So there is a strong possibility of war. And France and the United Kingdom are talking seriously about, you know, the United States has paid some lip service to it, but the United Kingdom and France are talking seriously about backing up the Ukraine. I call it the Ukraine. <laughs> There's another country I call the like it. I don't know why it's just it's just I've heard it so much that it sounds right to me, but. It is Ukraine, but anyway, they are talking about that. And they are NATO allies. If they get drawn into this and if they get fired on and attacked by Russia, now if it's just their ships invading or fighting them that get hit, does that invoke the treaty? I think it does. Maybe that could be squirreled out of, but if Russia fires back on those countries, oh yeah, definitely. But I think if their forces get fired on, we're drawn in. We're, we're in it automatically by the Treaty of NATO, which we principally created. So if we get drawn into war with, over Ukraine. It's almost our fault. Almost. Well, or maybe Putin's for making the advance. So Putin's making a calculated guess. He's looking at us and going, the United States is weak. These other guys ain't strong enough to do anything about it. We can take it and we can take candy from this kid and ain't nobody going to do anything about it. And they may be right. They may be right. It's a calculated risk. That he may think it's worthwhile. They got 100,000 troops on the border. We seem to say that he's really thinking about that. It could be wrong. But what would he do? To have the upper hand beginning? Take out our comm systems. Take out our GPSs. We might not be able to respond. Our nation could just fold. We could just implode. Nine out of 10 people could be gone within a year or more. It could be extremely ugly. 
here in America with no power grid. I talk about power grid defense a lot on, on uh, Green Graves. And you go to Green Graves and check that out. And a lot of other prepping topics over there. And by the way, further, you know, what do you need to do? Talk to your politicians and say, hey, do, do we really need to get in with on the Ukraine? Now, I got good friends, really good friends who say, absolutely. We need to be in there right now to stop them. So they won't go, well, if we show enough force, maybe the Russians wouldn't do it. Maybe they would back down because we have a strong president. They probably wouldn't be doing this. They sure didn't act like this when we had a previous president. When you like them or love them, I'm, not, I'm just saying they didn't do this. We're doing it now. China's acting up more. North Korea won't even talk to the current president. <laughs> won't even talk to him. Won't even talk about talking to him. Yeah. We got challenges, guys. Iran, North Korea, China, Russia. Are we managing these well? I don't know. I hope we do. I hope we can maintain peace. If we maintain peace in the next 20 years, the world will be amazed. We can be, have such an amazing world, you wouldn't believe it. But in the meantime, you better be prepared in case we don't. So I got one final thing. Like I mentioned, go to Trillic Market. Paul at last 15, get 50% off. Grow your own food, gardens. A garden in the house for this winter with microgreens. I got videos on green grapes showing you how to grow microgreens in your house. But I also got another special. If you go to prepwithgreg.com, you can get $100 <laughs> off a three month supply of food that lasts 25 years. If you're in a war like that, you need something like that. Trust me, you're really going to need it. $200, $100 off, which is too. $100 off a three month supply. Food's going up real fast. We got inflation. That's going to be a great deal, especially 20 years from now. <laughs> you might want to start eating this stuff anyway. You're going to say, wow, I'm glad I saved all that money. <laughs> so check it out. Prepwithgreg.com. 25 years, 2,000 calories a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. A deal that'll make you a winner, especially in the long term. We have a long, dark winter, especially in nuclear winter, where there's no power grid. Either way, you could have a long, dark winter. All right, my friends. Be safe. And I wish everybody a very, very happy Thanksgiving. Spend time with your family, your friends. Tell everybody you love them. You never know when you'll, you might never have another chance. It could be a car wreck. I always had one. I had one in April. I'm lucky to be here. Uh, you just never know what can happen. Or any of this other crazy stuff could come to pass. So tell your family, your friends, you love them. Every chance you get. And the real answer to hate and warfare is love. Just like light dispels dark, love dispels hate. Go out and shine your love light to the world. Maybe that's where we can make the real difference. And with that, I'm going to say thank you for watching.